Hello and welcome back to Unheard. If you're anxious that things are pretty chaotic already with war and culture war, well imagine what the situation is going to be one year from now. Because on November the 5th, there is a presidential election in the United States. So round about now, mid-November, the world and the US in particular will either be coming to terms with, or more likely emphatically rejecting with complete chaos, the results of the presidential elections that had just been held. Today, we want to look at some of the polling data to try and understand what the state of the race currently is and where it's likely to go. First, I want to make a couple of things clear because I know you are quite rightly a skeptical crowd. Many of you will probably think opinion polls are just corrupt or bogus or plain useless. And in many cases, you would not be wrong. I speak as someone who used to work for a polling and research company, so I am more than familiar with the weaknesses and errors they have made in the past. However, they are also the only evidence we have, so a skeptical reading of them, passing through the available data, can help us get a sense of what is likely or not likely to happen. In particular, it's worth doing now because it seems to me that there are some unexploded bombs coming our way that are quite plain to see and which the world, for whatever reason, is still just in denial about. One of them concerns Donald Trump, and the other concerns Robert F. Kennedy Jr. To help us unpick the available data, we are joined by Joe Bedell down the line from Washington, DC. He is an associate director at Stack Data Strategy, and they have just completed a huge sample survey to produce a state-by-state -state estimate of where we are now. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I hope you don't mind my skepticism there about uh, the methodology of polls, but I think it is quite widely shared. I understand your, uh, your skepticism. I think especially since 2016, uh, polling in the U.S. has kind of been in a, in a whirlwind. Uh, we've had results that we didn't expect. We had results that we thought were going to happen and, and they didn't. So uh, I totally share your skepticism for, for some of the polling in the United States. That's something uh, at Stack that we're, we're hopefully trying to change by introducing MRP to uh, a more wider American audience. Um, okay, so, so MRP, if you've stuck with us this far into the video, we're now going to go even more detailed and geeky because MRP stands for multi-level regression and post stratification and is basically a complex but so far it seems quite effective way of making local estimates at a state or even more local level from big sample national surveys. Is that a fair enough summary? I think that's a, a perfect summary in a nutshell, yes. Taking a large national sample and then because of the size of the sample and all the rich demographic data within there, we're then able to model down to very low constituency levels, low geographies where we have that census data already and we can build up from there kind of the picture of, of what's going on, on on a very local level based on a large national survey. So you guys have just done a big MRP study with over 15,000 respondents. And let's get the map up for what it spat out. Yes. Yeah, so just with the with the Biden Trump head to head, um, we have Trump winning 292 electoral votes. So winning winning the presidency. If the election were to be held today, he's losing the popular vote, similar to to um, what he did in 2016, and he's essentially building, rebuilding rather, kind of the pathway that he had in 2016 to the presidency. So in 2016, Trump won states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia. In 2020, Biden flipped those states back. So Trump's path this time around relies on him winning back those key states. He needs some combination of Arizona, Georgia. Pennsylvania or Wisconsin. Um, he could he could lose Wisconsin right now and, and still win the presidency. But those four states were uh, the closest margin in the 2020 election. So this battleground was is kind of expected, but this is the path that Trump is going to have to uh, replicate similar to 16 if, if he's going to have a shot at winning. If what you've predicted actually happens, it would be quite remarkable in a couple of ways because the same four states that you've just listed, Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, would just flip back four years later to Trump, who won them four years ago. It really feels like the whole election is just hinging on these four states right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think this kind of speaks to the coalition that uh, both Trump and Biden need to build in these states and, and some of the numbers within. 
Um, so you have states like Pennsylvania have a lot going on in the sense of there are, is a large amount of white working class or white non-college educated voters who Biden's made some inroads with, but that's also kind of what, what Trump was able to win those people to win states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. In Philadelphia, you have a lot of Hispanics, African-Americans. Biden's numbers are slipping a bit with those groups. Uh, so that's going to hurt him. And then, of course, you have the suburbs. So uh, the four counties around Philadelphia, everyone always looks at. It's where you have independent voters, a lot of women, and how they feel on you know, certain issues like abortion or the economy and how much they like Trump. That has a huge role to play. What's your analysis of why Biden and the Democrats have slipped among African-American voters? Because as you mentioned, in places like Philadelphia and other uh, cities in the South, that's a crucial demographic for anyone who hopes to win. Why is he less popular than he used to be? I definitely think some of it is uh, an economic issue. Um, there's been a, a very big push. Um, I think the, the Biden White House knows this. Um, with everything they've done on inflation, the economy, they've tried to rebrand with this Bidenomics. Um, it, it's one of their huge problems that they have right now. And, and I don't think as of, as of yet, people are as convinced that they're going to break through on that issue. What about the culture war stuff, though, Joe? I mean, President Biden's made a big focus of equity, diversity, making sure people of minority ethnic groups are probably represented, etc. You'd think he should be rewarded for that four years later. And yet the opposite seems to have happened. Right. And to add to that, he even has, you know, he has an African-American uh, vice president. He uh, selected the first African-American woman to be on the Supreme Court. It is definitely kind of one of the, the paradoxes that uh, I think is going on where, where Biden has done massive outreach to groups um, in this coalition like African-Americans. And yet his numbers are, are still slipping with them. And if we're doing a bit of a tour of the demographics, it feels like Latino and Cuban-Americans are also decisively moving into the Republican column. How much of that is true? I think Trump is now close to like 40. He's in the mid 40s with Hispanics, which is pretty astounding. I think actually going back to African-Americans as well, um, if the numbers are to be believed, it was around 20 percent um, Trump's doing with with African-Americans, which would be historical numbers for a presidential candidate in the Republican Party to win that that amount of the African-American vote. And with the result, the places like Florida, which if we remember back to 2016, was this knife edge state, well, it often has been in the past. And when it was all about Miami-Dade County uh, back in 2016, and when that didn't turn out for Hillary in the way that people expected, the whole course of that night and history uh, was made clear after that. It now looks by your numbers that Florida is pretty solidly just a Republican state. Yeah, I think we've had it, uh, we have it at about a seven point margin, uh, which, is, which is quite significant I mean, people I'm sure can remember back to 2000, Florida was the kind of quintessential swing state and how close the margins were. Um, yeah, Republicans have made inroads, I think, with groups you mentioned, like Cubans, especially. Um, there's been a ton of outreach and messaging, especially on socialism. Um, and I, I think that resonates with a lot of people in South Florida, uh, which has enabled that. Also, you've had you know very popular governors like Ron DeSantis, who has done a good well, a good job in his state to the point where you know he's getting reelected with a very significant margin for a Republican governor. Um, so I think kind of that the Republican brand in Florida is is doing quite well. And, and that explains uh, why basically we have Florida not not as one of the key battlegrounds right now because Trump is doing so well. And there. just to spell that out, in case it wasn't clear, we're talking about immigrants who come from Cuba, a communist socialist state to the US in order to escape that. They are business minded. They want freedom. They want to run small businesses. They are not socialists. And it's funny how few people realize that. They presume that all immigrant communities will be natural Democrats, but they're really not. Correct. Yeah. And I think um, in recent years with the election of AOC and um, members of com Congress, uh, some Democrats, you know, openly declaring themselves as democratic socialists, um, I, they get that sort of national coverage. And to a lot of immigrant groups like Cubans or Venezuelans who you know, are coming from these communist countries, that resonates with them because it, it means a very different thing here than it does in, in a place like Cuba or Venezuela. One other state just to pick out is Nevada that you've still got in the Biden column. Uh, I know that some other polls are less confident about that. And obviously, that's quite a swing state. What's going on in Nevada? 
with, I think, several of these states, um, I think the margin in Nevada is incredibly tight. Nevada is interesting. I think when we added in RFK Jr. and, and some of these third party people running for president, when we add them into the poll, uh, it actually, in states like Nevada and Arizona, it helps Trump significantly. Final thought on this head to head. If we put the map back up for our viewers, two th more things to say, which is the popular vote that you mentioned at the start. This is another kind of maximal chaos situation where Trump could win the Electoral College, Biden would have won the popular vote, and of course that will cause a great deal of unrest if that happens because there's already a lot of momentum behind trying to change the system, changing the Electoral College. People feel that it's not properly democratic. That's become a really sort of democratic talking point. If that happened, I don't know, it could, it could be very chaotic. Absolutely agree. People have obviously a lot of thoughts on the Electoral College. There might be some change in the coming years if, if some of these states um, start adopting uh, where, where they would reflect more of the, the popular vote of, in the country. But yeah, I absolutely agree. We're heading to an, another very strange situation where you could have a very unpopular person become the president again while losing the popular vote. Uh, and I don't have any answers on, on how the country will react to that. Well, it's just like Groundhog Day for us international observers. You know, every four years, it's, it sort of flips back and forth with the same controversies. This is like, it's the same election. This would be the same result as, I guess, eight years ago, pretty much. I mean, how would it differ from the 2016 result, in fact? I think the only other uh, states that would flip, uh, Michigan, Trump won in 2016. Uh, he, we don't have him winning in the model. It's still very close. Um, Nevada and Michigan are, are we have going for Biden right now, but they're very tight margins. Uh, and if you know, if especially kind of, we didn't include this in the poll, but there has been some some polling on this. States like Michigan have large Muslim populations in in some of the areas. Um, so I think what's going on internationally, uh, I believe the Arab American Institute had a poll out where Biden's support among Muslim Americans has has dropped fairly significantly. Uh, it's not like these people are necessarily moving to Trump, but they might be looking for one of those other options uh, in, in some of the other people running for president. So issues like that could, could come into play in a state like Michigan and create another 2016 all over again. We've spoken about a bunch of different groups which are losing support for or losing confidence in Biden and the Democrats. Are there any groups where he's actually gained in support in four years? They are few and far between. Uh, in our research, the one group I think he does slightly better with is actually uh, people aged 65 and older. Well, that is his demographic. They, they are exactly. his people. You haven't uh, zoomed in further to just the 80s and older? No, typically in American polling, uh, the way they break down age 65 plus is, is typically kind of the category that people look at. Just before we move on, I want to just compare to another poll that came out in the last week and just check. This is a New York Times Siena College poll. And I think we can put up on the screen the battleground state results that they forecast. It says Trump is ahead in five of six swing states. So again, if you're watching this and you hear the words New York Times and opinion poll and you are shuddering, you're, you're wanting to turn off the, the computer or the screen, bear with us for one moment because the New York Times here is reporting the, that Donald Trump, who is by no means a popular person in that news organization, is doing even better than you guys think he's doing. They, they also have him ahead in uh, Michigan. I would encourage everyone. I, I think the New York Times did a good job with this poll. They're typically, uh, they've been very good at a lot of the polls they've released over the years. Um, this had a lot of great, I think, just uh, granular data, but also they had a lot of uh, very interesting kind of anecdotal um, talks with voters and and those kind of moving away from Biden, but a, a similar picture that, to what we saw demographically. You know, Biden's losing ground with Hispanics, with African Americans, with young voters, with women. Uh, the coalition he kind of needs to hold together. Uh, he, he's losing it across these states, and that's what is you know flipping the election to Trump. Well, I find when I talk to people, particularly on the Democratic side, is there is a huge amount of complacency still about the coming election. They say, oh, no, Trump, that's never going to happen. He's dead in the water. People are over him. They talk about the criminal accusations against him. Meanwhile, yeah, there's just not a lot of preparation internationally either. It doesn't feel like it's talked about in Europe, but it's very likely by your data that actually in one year's time, 
it's President Trump. Yeah, I, I think Democrats are probably, uh, I think they're focusing on a number of things that they think will just bring them to victory. So abortion has been a huge issue since uh, the Dobbs decision. Uh, I, I think they're very much expecting, they're putting it on the ballot as much as they can across the, uh, across the country on uh, a statewide level because they know that drives their voters. So, so I think they're banking on making abortion a huge issue to drive out their base and to sway a lot of these independents. I also think too, they've had, they've had, they have had uh, pretty good success in, I mean, they, Democrats performed, uh, overperformed expectations in the midterms. Uh, I think they're something we've found in others as well. Biden is unpopular as kind of a national brand, uh, but there is a large segment of the population that doesn't want to, that will vote for Democrats. And the elections that, uh, the off year elections that were in the United States last week, I think showed this in places like Kentucky, you had a democratic uh, governor winning in a state like Kentucky. And he very much parroted kind of the same talking points that someone like Biden does, but he did not mention Biden by name. Uh, so I think you'll see, I, I agree with you that I think there should but be- But you have Kentucky going Trump 61% to 35%. I mean, it's right. not even close. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I think you'll see kind of nationwide uh, you're going to see a massive amount of ticket splitting of, you know, people that are disappointed with Biden, but they would be happy to vote for a Democrat for governor or for the Senate or for a local race. The bit I don't understand is the argument you just made, which you do hear a lot for Demo from Democrats, for example, that abortion is now on the ballot paper. Everyone is very upset about it. It's a, there's a clear majority uh, that thinks differently from the Supreme Court decision, etc. Why is that not reflected here? We've now got multiple opinion polls recently after abortion has been extremely talked about and much in the news for a number of months. It doesn't seem to be showing up in the polling. So it makes me skeptical that that is such a big issue after all. It's a strange issue for obviously the country, but the problem I think that Democrats will kind of have in the long run of focusing so much on abortion sometimes, it, it does drive away uh, voter, like Hispanic voters. A lot of them are Christian or Catholic. Uh, and you know, th this is an issue that they don't see purely as political. Uh, there's other elements to it. Uh, so I think in the long run, Democrats focus on abortion might backfire when they start kind of losing these key coalition groups that they need to maintain. Okay, so that's unexploded bomb number one, just in case anyone hasn't noticed it or hasn't really picked it up that currently, everyone from the New York Times across all the way to people like yourselves that are data analysts, stack data, seem to be agreeing that Trump is ahead and nothing else changing if Joe Biden is still the candidate, for example, and there are no big news stories concerning either of them or there is no fundamental shift, Trump will win. Let's go to unexploded bomb number two. So you also looked at an analysis which wasn't just a head-to-head -head between Biden and Trump, you also included these independent candidates and chief among them, of course, is Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who is really polling quite remarkably well. Uh, what did you have in your study, first of all? Yeah, so we in included Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, I think pretty much all the big polls are, are including him now. He's someone who obviously has incredibly high name ID coming from uh, the Kennedy political family. Uh, he also is, I think, very hard to define ideologically. He has some issues that I think people would consider very right wing. He has some other issues that people consider very left wing. Uh, so I think he is really trying to stake his own in this independent ground uh, of, of voters who maybe are they don't want to vote for Biden and Trump again. So they'll turn to someone like RFK. Uh, so when we included him in the model, uh, it, it, it's a mixed picture across the board. But nationally, it helps Trump uh, and, and it helps him because it changes uh, the dynamic in some of the states. So in Arizona and Nevada, Trump does better uh, when, when RFK is included. Um, it's a little different in some of the other states. So in a state like Michigan, including RFK actually helps Biden. Um, and in Georgia, it helps Trump a little bit. And in uh, Pennsylvania, it helps him a lot. Um, so it, it's not really a uniform swing across the country, depending upon the state. Uh, RFK is pulling more from, uh, from Biden than Trump. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of discussion about this on essentially who RFK is stealing more votes from. Uh, basically, what we found was uh, of the 2020 election, uh, RFK is taking 8% of Biden voters in that electorate. 
Uh, and then he's taking only about 7% of Trump's uh, 2020 numbers. So he's pulling about a point more from former Biden voters. Uh, and that can obviously swing states like Nevada to Trump. I mean, you've got pretty small numbers still for RFK here, 7.56% nationally. Is that because of the date? It's getting a little old now, this survey? Because there have been two recent surveys from, again, the New York Times and another pollster that showed 22% and 24% nearly one in four votes going to RFK if he's on the ballot. Where do you think that level is now? I would think it's closer to 10%. I do think um, Americans kind of do this, I think, sometimes when, whenever there's a prominent third party uh, candidate. In 2016, there were several uh, fairly noteworthy third party candidates. And I think if you looked at the polling a year out, it had you know 10 or 20% of voters saying that they would vote for kind of a third party person. Who was that in 2016? I mean, there were several candidates. Gary Johnson was a very prominent libertarian. You had Jill Stein running. Um, she's prominent on the left. Uh, in some individual states, you had uh, uh, candidates like Evan McMullen. Uh, I think he was from Utah, and, and that was part of it. I'm racking my brains here, but I don't recall Gary Johnson or Jill Stein getting 24% from a Siena College poll in 2016. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm not suggesting that they did. I, I'm just saying maybe generally, I think they're, if, if you added up all the third party options, um, you're right, it, it wouldn't be 20%. Um, but that's why I think there's something very unique with, with RFK. In other words, maybe it is 20%. I mean, sometimes if it looks like a duck and it cracks like a duck, it's been a long time since a third party candidate polls at that kind of number, even a year out, even in just opinion polls. It, it's quite remarkable and it doesn't feel like people have sort of cottoned on enough. Quite often you hear a little bit like you just said, oh, it'll probably disappear or it's just name recognition or it's probably nothing. What if it's not nothing? What if it's real? Since 2016, we've had very strange elections. Uh, so maybe this is the year that we get a third party candidate who gets a significant portion of the vote. And that just shows how disaffected and dissatisfied a lot of voters are with, you know, essentially voting for the same election that they had last time. So what actually happens there? I'm going to very quickly go across to this other uh, poll just by way of evidence, because even the New York Times, once again, they're no fans of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. They would have no reason to exaggerate his impact, I don't think. But they find that he's polling 24%. Their conclusion is that if you take him back out of the race, more people go Trump than Biden, i.e., in theory, he's pulling more votes away from Trump than Biden. And their conclusion, slightly differently from yours, is that actually a clear Trump victory becomes more of a muddled situation with a lot of toss-ups once you put independent candidates, including RFK, in the mix. Do you have any sense of why they might have come to a different conclusion? I will say there have been uh, not just necessarily polling analysis, but some of the other interesting things about a, a candidate like RFK they've looked at who, who is donating money to him. And one of the things that they found is he's getting money from uh, individuals who have given to both Biden or, or Trump or Democrats and Republicans. Uh, but he, he is getting more money from uh, people who had given to Republican candidates prior. Um, so yeah, there is, I think, a lot of uh, other things to look at to maybe show where his support is. Uh, another thing that analysis found, though, was that the, the majority of the money he's receiving are from people who uh, have not donated to a political campaign before. So that might, again, speak to that someone like RFK is a very unique candidate who's engaging people who typically would be tuned out with a Biden-Trump uh, rematch. That's quite remarkable, actually, isn't it? Because that similar effect happened for the first Trump victory, that there were people who normally didn't vote who turned out to vote for Trump. And that was one of the reasons why the opinion polls, ours included back then, ended up being off. So if RFK is in a way having a similar effect, that he's pulling new people into the voting community, that could throw off the results in even more dramatic ways. Again, speaks to the unique nature of RFK and, and what he's capturing across the country. So what do you think happens if we try and just game theory it? If we, we're in the next six months, eight months, into next year, you know, the candidates are confirmed, the actual general election is underway, and RFK is still performing like this, possibly even better. What then happens? Does he do a deal with one of the candidates? Is that even a possibility? Does he become the kingmaker, essentially, and says, you know, take me as your vice president on these conditions? Uh, seems to me like someone like Donald Trump likes to make a deal. That's not beyond the realms of possibility. 
Yes. Uh, again, since 2016, I think people should expect the unexpected when it comes to American politics. Um, again, one of the unique things about RFK Jr., he's not a politician in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't have a track record, I think, uh, that people can define him as much. So, yes, he maybe he is he's seeking something like a kingmaker status or or a, a possible running mate. Um, well, I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens. But if that happens, it'll be, you know, it, it, there'll be nothing like it that, that has happened in, in recent times. Can we conclude, Joe, do you think? I, I set up the discussion with the idea that there are these two unexploded bombs. The first is that Trump is pretty unambiguously ahead. And people need to just realize that that is the current situation, notwithstanding all the arguments about abortion being an issue and everything else. And the other is that RFK is not going away. And he has an extraordinarily high voting group, apparently, maybe as many as one in four, that could make this even more of an extraordinary election. I think if you're on the Biden team, you you have a lot of issues that you have to deal with. And I everything from RFK to the coalition you need to rebuild to repeat 2020. Uh, there's definitely a lot of struggles and I think they should, uh, and, and I'm sure they will with a lot of this polling coming out, they will, I think you'll, you'll see their campaign, I think, ramp up maybe sooner than expected, especially in these states that uh, ourselves and the New York Times has identified, uh, really doing a, a, a huge effort there. And again, to go back to, I think, like how Biden might not be very popular nationally, I think you'll see Democrats in a lot of these states, they're going to they're going to have the governors and the senators from these states that are popular as the person to kind of convey the Biden message rather than Biden himself. Final question for you, Joe Bedell of Stack Data. Are you doing any work for either campaign? <laughs> no, we're not doing any work for either campaign. Well, we'll talk again, no doubt, during the election. Thanks for sharing your information with us today. Perfect. Thank you for having me. There you have it. You may believe it, you might not believe it, but that is the state of the published official polling data on next year's presidential election. Trump's ahead and RFK is going to be an enormous disruptor. We're hoping to talk to him quite soon on this channel, so stay tuned for that and thanks for joining us.